Oh, welcome back. <clears throat> You're listening to Cross the Border. It's our Prophecy Reality Edition. And uh, this segment, uh, we're going to continue going through History Unveiling Prophecy by H. Grattan Guineas, uh, uh, or Time as an Interpreter. Uh, the, the thesis being, of course, that prophecy unfolds in history uh, rather than the book of Revelation being relegated to a brief period of time, a fleeting few years at the very end before Christ returns. Um, the, the thesis is, as the uh, pre-Reformation and uh, Reformation fathers believed, that they were living in the Revelation. They were living out that prehistory, because that's what prophecy is. Prophecy is prehistory. History written in advance by the Creator who saw the beginning from the end. As a matter of fact, history fulfilled is, is like the fingerprint of God on the Bible because no one could know the future except for the Almighty Creator who created the entire creation from beginning to end. So, they saw themselves in the pages of the prophecy. They saw themselves from the early church up through the last century. God's people have seen themselves in the pages of the book of Revelation. And it continues. Uh, we are in those pages. Maybe not us individually, but we can find the place where we're at. We can see prophecy fulfilled and currently being fulfilled in the pages of the Revelation. It is not all relegated to a three and a half or seven year tribulation deception period set forth or by, uh, set forth by the Jesuit Ribera in his thesis on an end time antichrist, of course, to vindicate the papacy from the accusation of the pre-Reformation and Reformation fathers that the papacy is, was, and always will be the seat of the antichrist, the man of sin. It was necessary for the counter-reformation Jesuit army to vindicate the papacy. And they have done a very good job, especially over the last couple hundred years, since the Antichrist, as foretold by the scripture itself, would gain control of the monetary system of the world. So now the Antichrist just makes sure that anything he likes gets backing and popularity in the world. So it's very dangerous to be popular if you think that you're part of the church because what's popular is in the outer court given to the Gentiles from our uh, symbolic picture of the church in Revelation. Okay, we're going to pick up here in history unveiling prophecy or time as an interpreter uh, with H. Grant and Guineas. And like I said, you can get a copy of this. Go to my free ebook tab there on my website, crosstheborder.org, and get yourself a copy of this. Just re you know, follow the instructions. Uh, with the exception, you request a copy of History Unveiling Prophecy. And I'll send that to you in a PDF form. And that way you can follow along, or you can buy one by going to the Get the Book page. Scroll down, and there's a link that says Low Cost Pocketbook Editions here. It'll take you to uh, our latest publications at Lulu Press, and you'll see that the one of the final ones is History Unveiling Prophecy. There you can get a full copy of it. Okay, we're going to pick up here on, uh, on page, let's see, Page 168, yeah, page 168 in your PDF version there. And the chapter is Dawn of the 20th Century. That's the chapter title. And of course, we know that our author, um, 
H. Grant and Guineas uh, finished his um, edition of this work about 1906. So he was living and he pretty much ended his mortality, was ended about the dawn of the 20th century. So basically most of the things he's speaking about occurred in the 19th century, that's the 1800s for all of you, those that might be confused about that. Okay, so we're on page uh, 168 at the bottom, uh, uh, subtitle three there, Confirmation of the Protestant Interpretation of the Revelation. From the denial and defense of the Protestant interpretation of the Revelation, we now advance to its confirmation by the events which have taken place since the French Revolution. To trace the fulfillment of apocalyptic prophecy in the period we have now reached, it will be needful to consider, one, the things foretold with reference to the period, and two, the things which have come to pass. On comparing the one series of things with the other, we shall see that the predictions have to a large extent been fulfilled and that the fulfillment is such as to afford, strong, afford a strong confirmation of the historic interpretation of the revelation, together with a clear indication of the nearness of those final judgments which mark the close of the present age. 1. Apocalyptic predictions relating to the present period. In the events of the French Revolution, we have already traced the fulfillment of the judgments of the earlier vials, from the first to the fifth, from the grievous sore inflicted on the worshippers of the beast or adherents of the papacy, to the judgments poured on the throne of the beast or the seat of papal sovereignty. These solemn judgments occupied in their fulfillment the century which terminated with the fall of Napoleon in 1815, beginning with the plague of infidelity and moral corruption, which was the precursor of the French Revolution. These judgments included the overthrow of monarchy and the abolition of the Roman Catholic religion in France with attendant massacres and wars, appalling in character and worldwide in effects, and culminated in the spoilation of Rome the captivity of the Pope, who died in exile, and the incorporation of Rome with France as the second city of the empire. In the order of prophecy, the judgments which follow these are those of the sixth vial, predictions under the sixth vial. One, the sixth vial is poured out on the river Euphrates and dries up its waters. Two, the meaning of the sixth vial is determined by that of the sixth trumpet. Under the woe of the sixth trumpet, a destroying army, vast in its numbers, issues from the Euphrates as a judgment on idolatrous Christendom. With one consent, historical interpreters have recognized the fulfillment of this woe in the overthrow of the Eastern Roman Empire by the Turks. This is one with, uh, what does he say there, um, one consent uh, at the end of the 1800s or the 19th century. Uh, they, with one voice and one consent, um, recognized this. Now, futurism has everyone confused. They don't recognize anything. They're still looking for things that have already happened in history to happen in the future. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you what, they have a lot to squish into the final few years. <laughs> yes, how, how's that going to work for them? Well, if you're really interested, read my book, um, When the Third Temple is Built, and I give you an idea there. But anyway, continuing on uh, page 169 here. With one consent, historical interpreters have recognized the fulfillment of this woe in the overthrow of the Eastern Roman Empire by the Turks, whose myriads of horsemen came from the banks of the Euphrates. Hence, the drying up the Euphrates takes place under the sixth vial 
has long been interpreted to mean a wasting away or notable dim, diminution of Turkish power involving the decline of its population and the loss of its territories. On the drying up of the Euphrates, three of oh, three. On the drying up of the Euphrates, three unclean spirits, like frogs, issue from the mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet, satanically inspired, for they are spirit they are the spirits of devils, and working in some sense miracles or wonders. They go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. In connection with this terminal event, it is added, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame, and he gather them together in a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Heathen-like infidelity, popery, and apostate priestcraft, it would seem then to be the three unclean spirits whose noisy loquacity, uh, whose noisy loquacity, symbolized by their being compared to frogs, is delusive and delusive influence bring about the final dreadful Armageddon conflict. Well, I got to build on that a little bit here. These three unclean spirits like frogs. Okay, now let's go back to the plague of the frogs from in Egypt at the hand of Moses and Aaron. The frogs covered the land. I believe there's an allusion here to the loquacity or loquaciousness or um, the fact that these frogs just will not shut up to put it in plain English. These frogs will not shut up. You want to hear them? Open ears and listen to what the world is saying. Listen to what the many in the church are saying that is in the visible church on earth and you will hear these spirits. Does that make sense? You want to hear the spirits? Listen to what is the loudest in the world. Listen to what is coming out of the mouth of the false prophet. And who is the false prophet? Oh, I'm going to clear this up for you right now. Okay, The false prophet is not some individual that's going to show up. That's, that's a, that's a counter-reformation okay? idea of the false prophet. False prophet, Okay, to figure out who the false prophet is, who was the true prophet? There's the question for you. Who was the true prophet? You want to know who the false prophet is, who was the true prophet. This clears it up for you right away. Now, who was that great prophet that Israel was waiting for? We had the, Israel had its prophets, but they all pointed to one prophet that would come. And Israel was awaiting, art thou that prophet? They asked the prophet. They asked the Messiah, art thou that prophet? The one they were waiting for. Because he was prophet, priest, and king. He was that prophet. He was the true prophet. Okay? So if Christ is the true prophet, who is the false prophet? Easy. You get it A. A hundred percent. The false prophet is the Antichrist. If the true prophet is Christ, then the false prophet is none other than the Antichrist, the Pope. Whoever sits in the seat of the papacy, whoever wears the triple crown tiara, yes, he is the false prophet. So I'm glad we cleared that up for you. So on the drying up of the Euphrates, three unclean spirits like frogs. And you know, this happened about the turn of the 19th century at the end of the French Revolution. So this gathering the armies of the wicked together to, for the great day of the battle has been going on for two, almost 200 years now. 
yeah, this is a long-term thing that we got going on. And so you want to hear the loquaciousness, these, these unclean spirits that are speaking in the world? You want to hear them speak and you want to know what they're saying? Then you listen to what's loudest in the world right now. Listen to them. What are they telling you? Oh, they're, what are they pushing out there in America today? Yes, abortion. Um, what, what, is, what is the other one? Uh, <laughs> where they kill the old people. What do they call that? Oh, I lost that word. That one. <laughs> uh, gender confusion, homosexuality, socialism. These are the loudest in the world today. Now, what, is the, what are the loudest voices in the visible church? Futurism is the loudest. It's the most loquacious. And then the false prophet, what's he saying? <laughs> He's saying all the things that the world and the loudest in the church are saying because his counter-reformation Jesuit army invented futurism. It invented liberal theology. It invented all this confusion. So what are the loudest voices in the world saying today? And that's what you're hearing. You're hearing what's coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, the dragon represents Satan. What's Satan pushing today? What's he loudly in the world pushing today? It's all you hear, man, is these frogs croaking. And what's coming out of the mouth of the beast? That is the government, the, the, the main government that rules the world. What are they saying? What are they pushing? You know, if you love Christ, if you hold to the word of God, you're a hater. That's right. That's what they're saying. That's what the beast is saying. If you don't accept people's sin, and their identity as sinners as equal with the righteous, then, you know, you're a hater. If you don't go along with the government, losing, giving up your liberty for security, if you don't go along with socialism and social justice, then you're, you're hated by the world. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, what is the Antichrist saying? Listen to him. He's saying the same thing that the world is saying, the same things, and there they are. There's these unclean spirits like frogs that issue from the mouth of the dragon, from the mouth of the beast, and from the mouth of the false prophets, satanically inspired, for they are the spirits of devils. And the false prophet, well, there are plenty of false prophets in the world. Not just the main false prophet guy up there, but uh, well, he has a lot of uh, a lot of people that are following him, and uh, they are also plural. All of these, because it says, for they are the spirits of devils, and working in some sense miracles and wonders, they go forth into the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's the culmination. That's what it's working to. And there's a like thing that happens at the end of the millennial reign of Christ where Satan is loosed out of his prison for the same purpose, for a season. So whatever that season is. A season is like four months, right? Yeah, so four months. Is that, would that be in years or days, a day for a year? Well, I don't, don't know, don't, doesn't matter to me. That's way, way in the future. That's another thousand years off. But we see the same thing happening at the end of this era before Christ returns. And then the same thing happens at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ because there will be people who while Christ is uh, living as king on the earth during the millennium, while we are in our glorified bodies, ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years. There will be people at the end of that period of time and during that period of time who will reject the gospel because of their very sin nature, unfortunately. Okay, three on the drying up. The Okay, we got that written. Let's see. 
In connection with this terminal event, it is added, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he should walk naked. And they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And he goes, he says here, heathen-like infidelity, popery, and apostate priestcraft would seem then. So he's kind of speculating on the interpretation of the, the um, dragon, um, beast, and false prophet um, symbology would be the three unclean spirits whose noisy loquacity symbolized by their being compared to frogs and delusive influence bring about the final dreadful Armageddon conflict. And you know, this is going to be the final war. I, I you know, they've named their, numbered their wars. Um, I mean, it would not have been uh, the, the rise in and campaigns of Napoleon, wouldn't that have really been World War I? And they had their 30 years war. What about that one? You know, aren't we really, haven't we really had th four world wars already? Was it then World War um, I, that they call World War I, wasn't it really World War Three? And then World War II, wasn't it really World War IV? And now they want a fifth? And of course, this one has to be six or seven, you know, this, uh, the Battle of Armageddon has to be really six or seven on a world war scale. World. This is probably really going to be the only, uh, the only worldwide war, I mean, involving all of the nations from every continent. Because, well, we had America involved, but the war wasn't on the American continent, unless you're going to call, unless you're going to count, uh, you know, Hawaii, uh, you know, uh, uh, as part of, it's not really, it's kind of an isolated island of its own. It's not really part of the North American continent. So the whole North American continent and South American continent were not really involved in warfare on their ground. So um, I think this is probably going to be the first really World War. <laughs> Speaking of World Wars, because there's a lot of talk about World War Three happening since they started numbering the World Wars, okay? <laughs> Put it that way. But this is going to be the final conflict before Christ returns. And then there's going to be another one at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, and that's going to be the final World War. Yeah, the Armageddon War that's coming. And so if you want to know what the Armageddon War is, it's not yet, it's not going to happen before Christ returns, but it's going to happen at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Anyway, we're going through um, history unveiling prophecy with a little aside here and there, and we will continue on page 170 when we return. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, 
we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border. This is our Prophecy Reality Edition. And uh, when we left off, we were uh, going through History Unveiling Prophecy, or Time as an Interpreter, by H. Grant Tan Guineas, of course, written and published uh, originally about uh, 1906. And we have updated and republished it. So if you want to get a copy of that, you can go to my website at crossborder.org. Click on the Get the Book tab and scroll down uh, to the bottom. It'll say Low Cost um, Pocketbook Editions here, and you'll find that book available there. Also, you can get a free e-copy by going to the free e-book tab there and following the instructions. Uh, the only difference being when after you follow the instructions is that you request in the comment section uh, History Unveiling Prophecy and we'll send you the current PDF form of the book, the one that we're using here on our uh, broadcast. Now, um, when we left off, uh, we were uh, in chapter, you know, what chapter were we in there? Let's see, we're in chapter, dawn of the 20th century, about page 170, under the subheading Apocalyptic Apocalyptic predictions relating to the present period. And that's why I do mention that the author was writing about 1906. So we try to keep it to that date where he's writing. Um, unless we move further ahead in our update. But for the time being, he is writing about the present period. And we are under... The in order of prophecy judgments which follow, these are those of the sixth vial. And that's what we're in. We left off uh, reading uh, number three, covering number three under that subheading, and we'll be moving on to number four on page 170. Four, the drying up of the Euphrates, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared, is an evident allusion to the drying up of the literal Euphrates, which preceded the capture of Babylon by Cyrus and Darius, kings of the east. As the literal Babylon is in prophecy the figure of the apostate church of Rome, the drying up of the Euphrates may well have a secondary reference to the wasting or consumption of the stream of wealth and prosperity by which the church is supported. Five. The warning under the sixth vial, Behold, I come as a thief. And the blessing pronounced on those who watch and keep their garments in preparation of the Lord's coming seem to point to the nearness at this juncture of the second advent and to, awakening, and to an awakening of watchfulness and renewal of preparation among the Lord's faithful followers for his coming. And as you notice, here we are uh, over a hundred years later, and we're still waiting for the completion of the work of the three frogs who go about the earth to, grab, to gather together uh, the wicked for that great day of God Almighty, that great battle that culminates before he returns to set up his kingdom. 
Continuing on here, part two. Predictions with reference to the fall of the papacy. The 1260-year duration of the papal power is properly measured from the era of its commencement, the, peri the brief period which extended from the Edict of Justinian in A.D. 533 to the Edict of the Emperor Phocas in A.D. 607, constituting the Bishop of Rome, Pope or Universal Bishop in the Christian Church, measured from the first of these dates, and I have to uh, make an aside here, uh, the first, the Edict of Justinian, granted the, the Pope the power to prosecute heretics in the Church, making him universal bishop over the entire Church, over the entire Earth. That was the, the Edict of Justinian about A.D. 533. Now, the Edict of Emperor Phocas in 607, uh, constituting the Bishop of Rome in particular, as opposed to, uh, we should add here, the bishop at Constantinople, being that there were two seats in Rome. There was the Eastern and the Western Empire, of course, the Western being Rome, and the Eastern being Constantinople. So the bishop at Constantinople, being a seat of the Roman empires, to, you know, put in place by one of the Roman uh, Roman empires uh, preceding the popes, the papal reigns, um, he wanted, there, there rose a division and a contest, so to speak, who would be supreme in the Church of God, which pope would be the pope of all churches. And Focus, Emperor Focus, settled the question in 607, constituting the Bishop of Rome, as opposed to the Bishop at Constantinople. So that's the difference between these two decrees. Uh, measured from the first of these dates, that is 533 A.D., the 1260 years of papal dominion ended in 1793, the time of the fall of the papacy and abolition of the Roman Catholic religion in the French Revolution. Measured from the second of these dates, the year 606, the 1260 years extend to 1866. According then to these anticipations based on the prophetic times of Daniel Revelation and the facts of history, the year 1793 and 1866 ought to have possessed, ought to have possessed a terminal character in relation to papal temporal power over the Roman world. I'm going to add a little there. Uh, five. Fulfillment of the events predicted under the six vial. In our chapter on the six vials, we pointed out the wonderful fulfillment of the predictions under the six vial of the drying up or wasting away of the Turkish power, which had been taking place since 1821, the year of the Greek insurrection. The general revolt of the Greeks in Moria, Wallachia, Moldavia, and the islands from Turkish rule, this was followed the same year by the capture of Tripoli and the liberation of the Peloponnesus. The destruction of the Turco-Egyptian fleets in the Battle of Navarino took place in 1827, since which the power of the Turks over their European, African, and Asiatic territories has ebbed as steadily as the tide. Since the Syrian massacre of 1860, the government of the Lebanon district in Palestine has been transferred from Turkish to Christian hands. The Turk still holds Jerusalem and the larger part of Palestine in its grasp, but the movement away from Mohammedan rule is steadily progressing, and thus the preparation for the restoration of the Jews to their own land. And remember our author is writing this about 1906, or finally published this in 1906, I should say. 
as he was working on this for a number of years before he did publish it. Contemporaneously with the drying up of the Euphrates, or Turkish flood, under the sixth vial, there takes place, according to Revelation 16, 13, and 14, the issuing forth of three unclean spirits like frogs, spirits of error which go forth throughout the world to gather together the anti-Christian hosts to the great and final battle of Armageddon. Now you remember the word anti-Christ doesn't mean those that are specifically aligned against Christ in the world from, say, demonic, satanic, or atheist quarters. The anti-Christian, in the proper definition of anti-Christ, means in the place of Christ, or it means vice Christ, under the definition of anti-Christ. So we go forth throughout the world to gather the anti-Christian hosts to the great and final battle of Garmageddon. And we have to realize that the majority of this host is going to be the majority of the church which fills the outer court of the Revelation temple scene. Along with everyone else that is aligned with them against Christ for their own reasons. Continuing, as this prediction points to the events of the most momentous character taking place in the present day, we ask for it, the special attention of our readers. 1. Issuing forth of the three frogs, meaning of the symbol. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 13, and 14. By this novel and very remarkable symbol, says Eliot, which followed next after the drying up of the waters of the Euphrates, but reigned still under evidently the sixth vial, there seems signifies some extraordinary, rapid, widespread, and influential diffusion throughout the whole Roman, or perhaps the whole habitable world. And I make a note here, our good friend E.B. Eliot writing, in his Hori Apocalyptica, uh, during the 1800s, uh, specifically from about 1840 to 1860, um, he says it's a rapid, widespread and influential and rapid diffusion. However, uh, here we are, some 150 plus years later, and we find out it may have seemed rapid to him, and I'm sure it was, it still seems rapid to us uh, as to these three frog-like spirits and their acting and their effect in the world, bringing and gathering together the forces uh, that are going to stand against God in this final battle. And we're speaking today, it's about 18, I mean, it's about uh, 2017, uh, we see that over the last 10, 15 years, we see a rapid, uh, um, a rapid war, at least in a war of words against Christianity. We don't see much in the way of open persecution, as in the killing of and burning at the stake of Christians or putting them to the guillotine. Uh, yet in America, but given history and given the Word of God, which predicts such things, that we, we may see things like that coming. The trend is definitely in that direction. We still have the law on our side, but how long will the law stand? We see even the law is falling away from us. We won't 
we won't dive into that any deeper at this point. We will continue with reading here what our very good friend E.B. Eliot says. By this novel and rare, very remarkable symbol, says Eliot, which followed next after the drying up the water of the Euphrates, but reigned still evidently under the sixth vial, there seems signified some extraordinary, rapid, widespread, and influential diffusion throughout the whole Roman, or perhaps the whole habitable world, of three several unclean or unholy principles, characteristic res respectively of the apocalyptic dragon, beast, and false prophet, from whom they appear to emanate, all being alike directed and speeded on their course by spirits of hell, and all alike in respect of earthly agencies employed to propagate them, resembling frogs, the well-known type of vain, loquacious talkers and agitators. Seems like they will never shut up. <laughs> Deluding and seducing the minds of men. Now, by the dragon, we know to have been men. For the evangelist tells us so. That old serpent, the devil, as in earlier days, animating and acting in the paganism of ancient Rome. The covering skin in which he had been primarily depicted. In a vision figurative of the final war of heathenism against Christianity at the opening of the 4th century, being that of the seven-headed dragon, and the seven heads said to figure Rome's seven hills. And of course we see the seven-headed dragon at chapter 12 of the Revelation. Again, by the beast, or rather according to the angel's definition of the thing intended in the, its description, the beast's eighth ruling head, we saw on, I think, irrefragable evidence that papal Rome is meant from and after the time of their occupying the dragon's throne and empire in Western Christendom. By the false prophet, at least with the further characteristics attached to it, so as in Revelation 19.20, of acting out its functions before the beast. We see the man of sin, the one who sits in the seat of God, showing himself that he is God, as Jesus was the true prophet that national Israel awaited. This false prophet deems to usurp his authority upon the earth, to sit in the place of the true Christ, the very definition of Antichrist. And what then? Our good friend E.B. Eliot continues here. If this be correct, the three spirits or principles that may be considered most fitly characteristic of these three several actors on the scene of the devil, in that character specifically in which he had agitated and spoken against Christ's Church in the times of pagan Rome, of the papal Roman Antichrist, of the priesthood of the apostate church. To myself, with reference to the first two, the answer seems sufficiently obvious that the one from the dragon's mouth is the principle of heathen-like infidelity, infidelity with its proper accompaniment of blasphemy and perhaps, too, of rebelliousness against rightful authority. When opposed to it, alike divine and human, by which sin fell the angels, and the one from the beast, the pure, direct principle of popery, based on his fundamental anti-Christian dogma, and the Roman Pope being Christ's divinely appointed vicegerent on earth. But on the question as to the third spirit intended, there is difficulty, for, just, for as just defined, it seems hard to assign the false prophet spirit to a sufficiently distinct character from the beast spirit, seeing that the two-horned beast is described as the chief organ, agent, and mouthpiece, as well as supporter of the papal beast, its principle, and uh, doesn't continue. Such I say, if the dragon, and uh, our good friend E.B. Eliot, uh, he, you can see that he struggled here 
with the identification of the false prophet and he tried to merge it with the second beast, the, the lamb-like two-horned beast of Revelation 13. I believe with if he had lived another hundred years or to the point where we're at now, these things would have been clarified. Because remember, as futurists, we focus mainly on fulfilled prophecy. And then we, from seeing where we're at in fulfilled prophecy, we see what has left yet to be fulfilled, and we try to get a feeling as to, I mean, there's some things that are clear as, as to what is going to happen in the future. But who some of the characters are, sometimes it's, it's very hard or difficult to place things uh, perfectly. And I don't think that we're meant to place future uh, characters who have not been revealed yet perfectly uh, or things that are yet developing that we may not be able to see clear, clearly, such as the nature of our method of interpretation, the very method of interpretation that is that we have learned from Scripture itself. Now, if you go, if you look at futurism, it's all speculation. It's all future. Nothing is verified because there's no way to verify anything. It's all speculation. You don't have to be right. Nobody can verify your speculation until it is passed. So it's understandable when we see uh, historicists in the past who could rightly divide, uh, the best of them could rightly divide up to the time that they were living in, things which had clearly come to pass and were easily uh, identifiable as past and past events, which they could uh, nail down and find their place in prophecy. Things that were developing or had not developed yet, sometimes they tried to put them in the past or tried to find their place, but the difficulty arises when there's the place has not arisen yet and people speculate a little bit, and, that's, and you can see, even he says, but on the question of the third spirit intended, there is difficulty. Well, realizing that the false prophet is neither, <laughs> the papacy is the false prophet, and the beast is the beast by itself, while it's under the sway of the papal power, it existed from its beginning without the papal power. It, be, it existed in, when it began when Rome was a republic. And then Rome became a dictatorship. It developed into a dictatorship under the Caesars, who ruled as they willed. They became absolute godlike authorities. And they ruled until the papal authority rose up. They were the let, or that which holdeth until it was taken out of the way, was the Roman Caesars. The, the kingdom being divided into ten parts, the papacy arose, and it was the, it was the, no, what's, what is it? It was the, what am I looking for? The, the factor, the papacy was the factor which brought the ten parts together the ten horns or the ten toes together and ruled for so many years. So to mistake the beast as the papacy and put that head in the wrong place because we realize that later on the papacy is separated from the beast upon the fall of the papacy for a time but working behind the scenes the papacy rides up, rises up again to its final place with the beast riding the beast, but riding the beast and controlling the beast completely behind the scenes while it had a time that it was separate from the beast. So we have these three distinct separate parts with their three different roles and they're defined as each receiving this frog-like spirit, of course, the dragon, which is paganism, the beast, which is government, 
which is people idol idolize in itself, because if you don't worship God, then you'll receive the government or as your authority, as your law giver. And then, of course, the false prophet has to be the papacy. What other choice do we have? So, we'll continue here with E.B. Eliot and uh, his idea of what he saw or how he tried to put things together in his time. He writes, Okay, I was saying, okay. And the one from the beast, the pure direct principle of popery based on the fundamental anti-Christian dogma of the Roman Pope being Christ divinely appointed vicegerent on earth. Okay, that's what the Catholic Church says anyway. But on this question as the third spirit intended, he said there is difficulty. So he admits that he's not quite sure, otherwise he would not say there is difficulty. Such I say... If the dragon, beast, and false prophet meant what I think it proved they mean, and see, you still see there's a question. He's saying, what I think, okay, appear to me to clearly to be the three principles or spirits intended, spirits in regard of which the prophecy intimates that they would act with unity of effect. And in this he is correct. If not purpose, so as to gather the powers of the world, very much as Ahab was seduced by the lying spirit uh, to Ram Ramoth Gilead in antagonism against Christ's truth and principle, introductory to the great coming day of final conflict. If these be the spirits intended, spirits to go forth, let it be remembered. After a certain progress made in the drying up under the sixth vial of the Turkmen flood from the Euphrates, it is only too obvious that within the last 20 or 30 years, the precise period marked out in the prophecy, for I will carry down my sketch now on revising from my fifth edition to the time present, A.D. 1861, there has been an outgoing of principles and spirits of error both in England and all over the world, which have most strikingly answered to each and every one. Speaking of these principles, our good friend E.B. Eliot writing about, as it says here, 1861, his final and fifth edition of the Horae Apocalypticae. And um, I think uh, we're going to hold off on uh, going any further in this. Uh, part two, the three unclean spirits of delusion which have gone forth since the French Revolution. I will add here that uh, E.B. Eliot saw it happening in the world at the time that he was living. And we've, we've seen things going back and forth since then. Um, but definitely in the last 50 years, and especially in the last 10 years, it seems that as it, as it moves forward, as these three unclean spirits like frogs working in the world uh, working, it seems that there's an acceleration factor as time continues to move forward. And uh, it has seems to have accelerated, or maybe it's just me and you that seem to see it this way. There is no doubt that these spirits are still working in the world and have been since they were released at the beginning of the sixth vial, which we can place about the time of the French Revolution. I have a posting on my website, it's called What Year Is It? And by a timeline derived explicitly from the scripture, we see uh, adding to that the Roman calendar, and we talk about all these things, we talk about calendation in this, uh, in this posting called What Year Is It? on my website. Uh, we have until about the year 2055 before the seventh millennium begins. You get this posting. You can read it yourself on my website at crossborder.org. Just put what year is it in the search box there, and you'll find that for yourself. You can verify it all for yourself. Uh, the Bible takes us up to the time of Christ and the desolation of Jerusalem, the 70 weeks prophecy carries us up to the, its completion 
about the time of Christ. And then from there, we go to the calendation, Roman calendation system, and we find that the seventh millennium from the creation event outlined in the scripture will be about the year 2055. Now, I'm not setting a date. I'm saying about the year. God did give Israel a countdown to the year that the, that great prophet, the Messiah, would show up on the scene. And he did show up exactly in the year that he was prophesied. And he was revealed to them as their Messiah when he came of age. As Luke records, he began to be about 30 years old. Very important. He was of age to be uh, a priest. Okay? Lawfully and legally, he was revealed as the, as the Messiah at the Jordan River baptism. Well, that's all the time we have for today. I want to thank each and every one of you for uh, listening and participating in this broadcast. May the Almighty bless you as you continue to walk in His kingdom day by day. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border dot org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org